Okay, welcome everybody. We have about two minutes before the start of the program. Um, before we get going, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have the ability for closed captioning if you prefer that option. You'll see on the screen now you can click on the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen uh, to enable uh, live captioning. If you, uh, if you don't want that, you can always hide it by clicking on the hide uh, caption uh, option on your menu. Um, Today's program will also be recorded. Uh, it's available pretty much immediately as soon as uh, the program is over by visiting either our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C-A-L preservation or facebook.com slash C-A preservation or you can visit our LinkedIn profile to find uh, today's recording as well. Um, we're also uh, broadcasting live to Twitch if you're a Twitch user. Uh, maybe a few of you are out there. Um, we have about 150 people signed up just for the Zoom portion today, so I wanted to remind you that your questions should come in early. If you'd like to ask those questions, we recommend you ask them as soon as you think of them, uh, and you can do so using the Q&A box. I've enabled the option for you to upvote comments and or upvote, upvote questions by clicking the uh, thumbs up symbol next to any question that you see that you'd like to see addressed first. And our moderator today will probably take them in the order of the questions uh, taken, um, upvoted. Uh, and um, as a reminder, uh, our programs in an, are an hour in length. So today's program will start in about a minute here at 12 noon, and then it'll conclude by 1 p.m. We have a live uh, tour um, that will be broadcast. If you'd like to watch the YouTube version in 4K, you can always do that by visiting the link. We'll provide that to you. Uh, soon after we start the uh, broadcast version. If you have issues with the live stream, you can always visit the YouTube link. Um, that portion will be about 26 min minutes in length. And then we'll uh, turn over for a, uh, we also have a, a live presentation of um, some history of the Posey tube. And that'll be about 15 minutes, but we also have 15 minutes for questions. So again, please ask those questions early. It's now 12 noon. So I'm gonna, um, mention a few things before turning it over to our speakers today. Let me stop share here. Um, wanted to welcome everybody to today's program. My name is uh, John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. There we go. Um, today's program is made possible by the support of a number of partners, and I wanted to acknowledge those partners today. First of all, we have the Alameda County Transportation Commission, Oakland Heritage, Caltrans, and JRP Historical, all of whom played a role in this project. And um, you'll get to hear from some of them today. Uh, my name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. We're really excited about the virtual tour today. You'll uh, be able to see a live video tour broadcast. Uh, but before that, we're also gonna have a presentation of the history of the Posey Tube. You don't want to miss that. If you'd like to jump over to, if you're on uh, social media, please feel free to ask questions there as well. We'll be moderating that or uh, monitoring that, and I'll share that with our moderator today. Uh, recordings will be available, as I mentioned, on our YouTube and our Facebook channel. Um, I wanted to thank our panelists today and then turn it over uh, directly to, uh, first I'm going to turn it over to Naomi Schiff from the Oakland Heritage Alliance, who will say a few words about uh, Oakland Heritage and this project, and then we're going to have our moderator speak. So uh, welcome, Naomi. Thank you. Uh, Oakland Heritage Alliance is a 42-year-old local nonprofit organization, and we've enjoyed working with Caltrans at CPF, and we'll be scheduling in-person tours of the Posey facility over the next year for a few lucky tour goers. Uh, as well, we have many other events and we hope you'll join us on June 15th as Dorothy Lazard discusses her new memoir. She's a much beloved uh, retired librarian from the city of Oakland and uh, grew up here. And she will talk about the challenge of writing personal history. Visit www.oaklandheritage.org for details and for information about our summer walking tours. Thanks, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Naomi, um, and thanks, John. Uh, so I'm Helen Blackmore, the Acting Office Chief. 
uh, for Cultural Resource Studies at Caltrans District 4. Um, and again, just want to thank CPF and Oakland Heritage Alliance for making um, this webinar possible. Um, this program is one of the Section 106 mitigation measures for the Oakland Alameda Access Project. Um, and again, if you want to go on an in-person tour of the facility, um, check out the Oakland Heritage Alliance website. So today, the panelists are Chris McMorris, the principal at JRP, Byron Lim, Caltrans Project Manager for Tunnels and Tubes, and Gary Connect, who has conducted walking tours of the Jack London District uh, since uh, 1988. Um, so thank you, you three, for joining and presenting. Um, and Chris is going to give a short intro, and then there will be a 20-minute video, as John mentioned, and then Q&A. So please add questions to the Q&A box um, while we're showing the video, and Chris is going through his presentation. Thanks. Over to you, Chris. All right. Thanks, uh, Helen. All right. There we go. Um, so, yeah, the George A. Posey II is located in Alameda County in the San Francisco Bay Area. It connects the cities of uh, Oakland and uh, Alameda. One second. There we go, some maps to give us uh, context. Uh, the structure was designed and built between 1923 and 1928. So here are some recent uh, photographs from the Historic American Engineering Record documentation that's getting prepared. Uh, the Posey Tubes construction resolved decades old transportation issues connecting the commercial core of Oakland and Alameda during a period when both communities and the region were growing quickly. There's a few more. The city of Alameda uh, is an island now, but it was a peninsula connected to the mainland uh, at what is now the eastern part of the island. In 1902, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a navigable channel to connect the San, Le San Leandro Bay to the south with the Oakland Inner Harbor. Oakland's waterfront developed after the city finally re wrested control of the waterfront from the railroads in the early 20th century. Shipbuilding and commercial commerce grew, particularly after the Panama Canal was completed in 1914 and during the First World War. New wharves and warehouses uh, sprung up at that time. The voters approved a, a huge bond measure for harbor improvements in 1925. And in 1929, uh, U.S. Customs Port of Entry was established in Oakland, allowing international shippers coming to come directly to Oakland and leading the way for Oakland to become one of the more important, one of the most important West Coast ports. It's at this time in this early part of the 20th century uh, also that Alameda was becoming a residential suburb of Oakland. At this time, uh, there were two swing bridges, meaning they, they were rotating movable bridges between downtown Oakland and Alameda, which impeded ship movement in the Inner Harbor. There was a vehicle and pedestrian bridge at Webster Street and a railroad bridge at Harrison Street, approximately where the Posey and Webster tubes are now. By the 1910s and 1920s, these swing bridges had been problematic for more than a decade, and the War Department condemned them in 1916 and then again in 1921 as threats to navigation and commerce. There's a, a picture of the Webster um, Street Bridge there on the left. You can see how it rotates in the middle. The, um, the problem was when the bridges swung open, the open passage was very tight for large ships. Also, uh, it was a problem for the vehicles, pedestrians, and streetcars and trains because of the delays caused by the bridges needing to be open so frequently and each time being a slow process. So during this time that the, uh, that the calls came for a tunnel to be built to connect Oakland and Alameda. The Alameda County Surveyor uh, Perry Havlin completed studies for a tunnel in 1913. You can see it, they're sort of depicted there in the newspaper on the right. The plan included multiple tunnels, tunnels separating the vehicle and pedestrian and streetcar and railroad traffic. Now, the study illustrated the feasibility for building one or more tunnels, but it was shelved uh, as there was greater consideration given to replacing these uh, bridges, which would have been far less expensive. With the increased um, continuing increase in land and water traffic after World War I, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors directed in 1922 
the then new county surveyor, George Posey, to prepare plans and cost estimates for a tunnel under the Oakland estuary. Posey had been involved with the earlier Havland study as the former county um, surveyor's deputy. Posey and Havland also worked together in private engineering practice. There's the, there's the design uh, as depicted in popular science. Posey's plan for a single Oakland estuary tunnel were completed in early 1923. In May of that year, the Alameda County voters approved bond issues for the tunnel's constructions. Um, the plant went out to bid in February 1925 for two varying designs. One was precast concrete uh, tube section, and the other was a concrete steel tube. The latter was similar to other tunnels that had been built or were being built. The county contracted with the San Francisco firm of A.J. Crocker Company for the precast concrete tube design, and the Crocker firm formed the California, California Bridge and Tunnel Company for work on this project. Construction began in, in May 1925, and it in involved um, 12 precast reinforced concrete tubes that were built at the Bethlehem Shipbuilding Dry Dock at Hunters Point in San Francisco. Sections of the tube were then floated to the site, as you can see on the top left there. They were then submerged and placed in a trench at the bottom of the estuary. Sections were then joined and sealed. The tunnel was then backfilled and anchored at the portal buildings at either end. Uh, these portal buildings will house the ventilation system. Each tube section, um, the end tube sections near the portal buildings were cast in uh, on site in drive trenches. The final tunnel, the tube section was 0 0.67 miles long. And then the, with the approaches uh, on either end, it was the whole structure is 0 0.85 miles long. Each approach is flanked by retaining walls with railings that ended with tall pylons that are capped with uh, lights. There are some details uh, of the design. The Posey tube's design and construction was covered widely in newspapers as well as engineering, transportation, and science periodicals. Now, the first subaqueous uh, underwater vehicle tunnel in the United States was already under construction when work began on the Posey Tube. This was the Holland Tunnel in New York under the Hudson River, connecting Manhattan and New Jersey. The Holland Tunnel opened in 1927. The Holland Tunnel used a steel plate boring method to build the tunnel. And um, there were other earlier underwater tunnels that had been built but that, in the 1910s uh, for railroads. The Posey tube's design of precast reinforced concrete tube sections had never been used before for an underwater tunnel. The operational components of the tube were cast directly into each section of the tube, including the ventilation ducts and pedestrian walkways. The Posey tube was also equipped with an innovative transverse ventilation system that brought fresh air in and took vehicle exhaust out. And you're going to hear a lot more about that in the virtual tour. In August uh, 1928, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors named the tube in honor of George Posey for his work as county surveyor and as the chief engineer of the estuary tunnel project. The two opened a great fanfare uh, uh, on October 27th, 1928. And there you see a portrait of Posey on the right side of that uh, newspaper article. Here's some historic photographs. Uh, soon after its construction. And the Art Deco style portal buildings uh, were designed by the Alameda County architect, a man by the name of Henry H. Myers. Here are some additional ones. So the Posey II met the demands for vehicle traffic for at least a decade, but this began to change in the late 1930s. Ferry service between Alameda and San Francisco had ceased after the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge was completed in 1937, which resulted in more car commuters to San Francisco. And those coming from Alameda, they would go through the Posey Tube and through the streets of Oakland to the Bay Bridge. Traffic increased uh, dramatically during this time period in both Oakland and Alameda, particularly with the establishment of the Naval Air Station Alameda. Uh, and the expansions of activities and shipbuildings in the Port of Oakland during the lead up to World War II. World War II. 
local officials began to see the demand for another tunnel right here. However, um, the California Division of Highways, the Caltrans's predecessor, focused on freeway construction during the post-war period in the late 1940s and 1950s, acquiring the Posey Tube into the state system in 1947. The Division of Highways built the Nimitz, also known as the East Shore Freeway, today I-880, in stages during the mid-1950s in a corridor between 5th and 6th Streets in Oakland, as you depicted there uh, on the upper uh, left. And the, it's, I got a red circle around where the Posey Tube's uh, open approach there is. Um, constructing the freeway viaduct directly over the Posey Tube's Oakland approach, which you can see in that lower um, left photograph. On the right, the map there, the blue circle um, is for where the Posey Tube is. So, and this is what it looks like today. This is, uh, so when the freeway was built, this is when the pylons flanking the Oakland approach were cut in half, or maybe even more than half. Um, so around this same time, it's when the state began plans for what became the Webster tube construction, um, which was uh, another tube under the estuary that began construction in 1959 and opened for traffic in 1963. The Posey tube has had, um, you know, various times when it's gone under, you know, uh, alterations and changes, particularly in the early 1960s when renovations were done at the same time that the Webster tube was coming to completion. At this time, the Posey tube was converted to one way from Alameda to Oakland and the Webster tube took traffic from Oakland to Alameda. Um, major changes included the ceramic tiles and new lighting installed in the tunnel. New street lights at the approaches, these Cobra style lights that you see here, and the portal building's glazing uh, was replaced. Much at this time, also, uh, much of the original precast Art Deco relief panels with chevrons and seagulls and the like were removed. Another period of major alteration was in the early 2000s and in 2015. The tube ceiling tiles were replaced with a concrete overlay and replica light standards were installed at the approaches. In the rehabilitation in 2015, they reinstalled missing architectural details, replaced the doors and windows on the portal buildings, and refinished their exterior services. So uh, to finish up here, I want to give you a summary of the significance of the Posey tube. It is the first subaqueous tunnel built in the Western United States specifically for automobiles. It is important for its association with the development of the automobile as the primary method of transportation in California. Its construction resolved decades long transportation issues of connecting Oakland and Alameda. It provided for an unobstructed shipping channel through the Oakland Harbor permitting for further development of the harbor. It is also significant for its innovative engineering, this construction method using this precast reinforced concrete tubes completed off-site and installed in an excavated trench on the estuary floor. It's also noted for this continuous transverse ventilation system. Lastly, the Posey tube is significant for the Art Deco architectural design of its portal buildings. I'll stop sharing. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, now give me a second here to get our video queued up. And just as a reminder, this portion of the program will, is a pre-recorded tour of the, this is the first time it's been available to the public of the Oakland Alameda Posey Tube. Um, and we will play this for about 26 minutes. Um, feel free to continue to ask questions if you have them in in the Q&A box and let us know in the chat box if if you have any issues watching the recordings I've provided the link to the YouTube link which we recommend you watch later if you'd like in a higher resolution but for now we're going to be broadcasting this in 1080p so uh here we go My name is Gary Connect. I have been a resident and a worker in what we know as the Oakland Waterfront Warehouse Historic District for 37 years or something like that. One of my favorite neighborhood buildings 
is behind us here, the, the Posey Tube Oakland Portal. And I'm here with... Thank you, Gary. Uh, Byron Lim from Caltrans District 4 Maintenance. And I'm the uh, program manager for Tunnels and Tubes. And we're going to go on a tour of the Posey Tube Portal uh, today. And we're going to try and keep it brief and make it fun for those of you who are unable to come on one of our in-person tours that Caltrans will permit us to do a few times later this year, maybe next year. And if it catches on, maybe another year or two after that. But in the meantime, this is your opportunity to understand what goes on between Oakland and Alameda, California, if you get in a car and drive through the Posey tube. What I want to look at is, this is the Posey tube portal, the Oakland portal of the Posey tube. And it's, it's a wonderful example of uh, quasi early art deco architecture with designed perfectly for the automobile. Um, and, uh, and in keeping with the effort to make Alameda County as modern as possible, on the outside, what you can see is some some cast iron or some iron grills, which are air, fresh air intake locations. And behind the glass curtain wall up there is an open area where the exhaust from the automobiles inside the tube is blown out. And we'll go inside and look at all the fans and all the equipment that makes this happen. Um, there are three things I want to point out. Uh, the iron grills on the sides, each side are where fresh air gets sucked in and blown through the underwater tunnel. The area behind the glazing up there is open. It's where exhaust fumes get blown up into the atmosphere. And then there are two green things that are doors. Uh, they're permanently in place but they're there because the fans that are inside had to be put inside to uh, uh, somehow, and that's where they were put in, and that's where, if they ever need to be replaced, they can be pulled back out. The fans, the exhaust fans in, the four other ones downstairs, were our, they, they built the portal on top of them, so good luck ever getting them out. But it would be nice to get the arch with a little bit above it. And wh what I want to say is this is the Posey tube. And you can hear it in the background. It used to be a two-way tunnel. Now it's one way since 1964. But that's the portal building. The tube itself is downstairs. When we're inside where it's quieter, I'll say a little something about the construction of the tube. I think we can go up on the roof and talk about the construction of the tube. shows the Nimitz Freeway and how it destroyed the approach to this lovely, the lovely approach to the Posey Tube. And it just cut through. It kept Alameda County ahead of things with a new freeway. But it sure made a mess of the tube.
let's let's talk about the posy tube. We got it going underneath us here. We're up on the roof, and the posy tube is especially important as an engineering marvel. It's an underwater tunnel. It's total of about 4,500 feet long. But it's basically, imagine a piece of pipe like this, 37 feet across, perfectly circular. It was made out of precast concrete, rebar and concrete, 203 feet long sections poured in San Francisco, sealed at each end, towed with a barge across the bay, and sunk in the estuary. There were 12 pieces like this that were created in San Francisco and put in the estuary. All right, Each section had a roadway in it, precast in it and a ceiling precast in it. This left you room underneath to blow fresh air in there, and above the ceiling to suck exhaust out of the tube. An underwater tunnel has a big problem, especially one like this designed for automobiles, has a big problem with car exhaust. Uh, and it need, ventilation is a critical safety feature of what goes on in it. Inside these simple, Art Deco buildings are the ventilation system, the electric system, the whole brains of the Posey tube. So Gary, what you're looking at, these big openings or the uh, exhaust um, Gary, the fans that um, there's, there's huge fans uh, in the next level that will go down. And then those exhaust fans will, will exhaust the uh, the air out of the, uh, the tubes. There are four, four fans yes. and one, two, three, three, four. That's right. And the monitors are up in the Caldecott no, Tunnel? No, no, they're actually inside. But the controls? The controls are up in Caldecott Tunnel. And do they turn on automatically? They turn on automatically. OK, I assume in 1928, when this was mm -hmm. completed, yeah. There was somebody in right, the here, right. and he was smelling <laughs> the air and saying, okay, let's turn on another that's, fan. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. All right. And we're not going to go up those ladders. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Originally in 1928 was glass like you see today. In 1964, they switched it out for cementitious panels, in other words, opaque stuff. And you could, from 64 until whenever they did the restoration work 10 years ago, uh, it was opaque. You couldn't see through it. OK, well, this is a secret part of the tour. It's not on the in-person tour. It's not available normally to anybody unless they're in a hard hat and accompanied by Caltrans. Um, and it requires climbing two ladders, so it's not accessible. Um, and this is meant to be the accessible part of the tour, so have at it. These are the motors for the dampers that would open for the exhaust fans that we saw up there. So we took them apart, uh, uh, rebuilt them part by part. And then, you, as you can see, there's some... Uh, um, um, component that is new, but you could definitely tell these are the original. And these are still used yep. every day every, yep. to open and close the damper. That's correct. They're not part of the fan system, but they are part of what right, right. Opens, controls yep. Yep. the damper yep. Yep. and gets you to decide whether you got one, two, three, exactly. or four. Exactly. We're looking again at the exhaust side of the system. This is the air that goes across right. above the ceiling. Right. And actually, it sucks right. the exhaust out of the building and That's exhausts right. it straight up. So we're going to go look yep. at one of the big fans. Dum, da dum, dum.
Whoa. Explosion. So what's happening is we this is the air that goes up to the upper chamber. The damper doors open. This is the uh, uh, the exhaust fans that would remove the uh, air up above where we were in the roof. This is the top of the tube. Right. And it's sucking the air out. This fan in here is sucking it out and shooting it up. Right. Let's get the camera in here to get a close look. And this is all original. And we did refurbish it, but it's it's from day one. And, and as you know, they don't build them like they used to. <laughs> it, it's doing okay. <laughs> it's doing okay. And that's the top of the roadway. That's the ceiling of the roadway. And that's where we're sucking all the exhaust out. I didn't get sucked or blown in there. I <laughs> Someone was here more or less 24-7 to watch the traffic. And the traffic, when this was built, was two ways, one lane in each direction. And, you know, when it opened in 1928, on October 27th, which was a Saturday, there was a contingent of officials on the Oakland side, led by Mayor John Davey, and a contingent of officials on the Alameda side, led by the mayor whose name I don't know, Cole. Um, and at exactly 2.30, they marched to the center of the tube and met up and celebrated and cut the ribbon um, and... Uh, it wasn't until 6 o'clock that evening that traffic could actually go through the tube. But it was a big day. It was a celebration of an amazing achievement in automobile-oriented travel in the state of California. And in California, we love our automobiles. This is such a great shot as you're going down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, love it. So we're and at the roadway. Yeah, exactly. We're at the roadway level now, right? And this is the, uh, our, our, um, our loading um, door that we, we would bring in big equipment and whatever we need, uh, a load-up door here. And if you open that door, it goes out to the walkway. Uh, the walkway. Wow. You know what Let's get some noise. Sure. Oh, yeah, get up close and personal. I, I will comment, if you can hear me, that the tile is not original. The tile finishes were installed in about 1964. Um, it was just painted concrete before that time. Uh, but the rest of the tube, and if, if you look up and turn around, you can see the roof above which we're sucking the air out and the roadway below under which we're blowing fresh air into the tube and keeping everybody healthy and happy. All right, so what do we got? So what we got here is we got two blowers on this side of the tube. We have two more blowers on that side of the tube. So these are the fresh air uh, um, blowing into the, uh, the travel way. Underneath uh, under, the roadway. Underneath the roadway, yep. 
and they're essentially like your hair dryer that you'd get in, in, at home that looks like a gun, <laughs> turned upside down, and they're just blowing air underneath, and That's there's correct. one, two on this side, right. and one, two on the other side. Right. So if you're wondering where, where we get the fresh air, um, ah, yeah. you, you, when we get down here, you'll see it's almost three-story, if not higher, of open space. Uh, to draw the fresh air from the uh, the grate that you were talking about from the outside. So these these uh, these blowers would pull the air from the outside, push the air into the tube. Oh yeah. So that's the fresh air there. Right. Right there. Right. We're we're standing in the fresh right. air right here. Right. Ah, that. Fresh right. air, right. lovely fresh air. And yeah, if the camera looks in here, you can see the back side of those grills. The grills are in this line right here. You need to look over that way. So, so you can see the conduit here where they draw the air in. The blowers will blow the air through this chamber into the room. Beautiful. And is this an old original motor? Right. The blue one right there? Yep. Okay, now I read that there are 75 horsepower motors. Could that be a 75 horsepower right. motor? That, that is correct. All right. So it's amazing how much of the basic equipment is still in use today. Obviously, the controls and the electrical system has been upgraded Great. totally. Right. But the mechanics that George A. Posey came up with in 1928 Still, in still here. Yep. Still here. A picture of the danger sign, just so you can flash that on the screen occasionally. So Gary, we're going to go to the other side of the tube, where the other two blowers are, and we're going to walk underneath a little tunnel, if you will. So watch your head. Okay. And and uh, by the way, these are the pumps, just in case. This uh, building gets uh, flooded, so these are the pumps that will draw out. Well, well let me ask you about pumping, right. because that's the other thing. The tubes go down, mm -hmm. and obviously rainwater and right. other water goes inside. I believe there are pumps somewhere down there. They are. Where did they pump the water to? So there's a, uh, there's a holding chamber down there. Underneath? Underneath, and, yeah. then, and then it's able to hold... Uh, um, the, the water, as well as there's pumps there that will pump it back out. And when they pump it out, where does it go? It where does come, it empty? Right. It'll, it'll come out uh, to here, and, it, and it'll, there's a pumping system that will um, uh, remove the water. And now we watch our head. So we are literally under the roadway right here. Right here, okay. And you can hear one of the blower is working. There it is. And it's just sucking the air from the natural outdoor air. It's sucking it through those lovely right. iron grates right. and just sending it underneath right. the roadway right. where it slips right. up on either side. You could feel a little bit of a breeze. I do. Right? I do. As it's drawing air from, from up above. It's, it's, it's well designed at that time 
yeah. to use the fresh air from the outside, bring it into the building yeah. to open space like this, and then let the motor work to push the air in. Well, what I love is since 1928, this thing's been operating. And yes, it, from a maintenance point of view, you had to do stuff, but it's still the basic system right. that we started with. Uh, and, and that George Posey came up with yeah. for ventilating this underwater tunnel. I love it. Howdy. <laughs> So that camera is letting the folks know in Caldecott right. that we're wandering right. around here? That's right. And they can send the, the OPD down here or the Caltrans Police Department? <laughs> All right. But so for anybody who wants to break in, you're going to get both OPD and CHP to take care of you. So be nice to this historic resource. Don't come breaking in here. I love this building. We love this building. And this marvelous activity that goes on day in and day out here is just astounding. Somewhere in what I read that there is a little office, but I, I, I don't think they even knew how old or new it was. Wow. We're in a funny little office that we don't know how old or original it is. But I guess if you wanted a windowless, dark, dreary office, this would be it. Have a seat. <laughs> yeah, operator room up there. Urgent panel. What's an urgent yeah. panel? So, um, so originally, uh, when the tube was designed, um, it was for ventilation only, not necessarily for fire, uh, to provide fresh air into right. the tube and, and remove the uh, uh, CO out of it. Uh, as we started having more uh, cars going in. Uh, there would be fires, you know, uh, so, so we had to start adding fire life safety system right. into the, the tubes. And these newer and, looking right. units are right. part so of that. Right, so you have to have emergency backup power. You have to have <coughs> uh, 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 cameras inside to see where the fire is. Uh, we have to uh, uh, modify the ventilation to be able to exhaust uh, out the, 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 the smoke from the fire so that the first responders could respond safely. Could in, get in. Could get in. So we, we had to put urgent panel to adjust the fans because you don't want the fans blowing into yeah. the fire. Got it. Right. So, so these are things that we had to add on as we move forward. There, there was um, obvious remodeling done here uh, in 1964, and it was done in conjunction with the completion of the Webster Street. Is it called a tube? Do they call it a tube. And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea why we have tubes here in Oakland, but there are tunnels everywhere else in the world. And the only thing I can think of is, okay, you take a pipe, you call it a tube, and it's so innovative the way they ventilated it. Fine, we'll call it a tube. Could have called it a straw, but other tunnels that were done underwater, like the Holland Tunnel, which opened a year before this one, was done in steel. It was a steel tube, essentially. This is the first reinforced concrete tube, period, anywhere in the world to handle automobiles.
Hey, welcome back. John, thanks for putting together such a great video. Um, oh, you're welcome. I'm going to invite the panelists to uh, turn their cameras on and we'll get into a little bit of Q&A. Um, thank you for putting questions in the box, in the question box. Um, I do want to provide one, one pre-prepared question. Um, it's going to go to Gary. Um, the Posey Tube and the Porta Buildings were a huge local undertaking. Um, would you like to share some some of that local history? Sure. If if we can take a look at a photograph that my friend and colleague Chris Patillo sent me, um, I I can just say a couple of quick things about it. This uh, Chris saw I was on this panel, and so she sent me a photograph that may or may not come up on the screen that shows her <laughs> her her grandfather uh he's the one in the plaid shirt that you can't yet see um but he was a cement worker on the on the project and when they were nearing completion da da da, -da the <laughs> what what he's he's in the plaid shirt there near the center and and um when they were nearing completion the uh i assume it's the cement finishing folks um who did the original interior um who who are depicted in that uh picture there with him he was always uh listed in most places as a cement uh finisher and one thing about this picture, you might look a little closely. There's a person um, above in the window there. That's where they had someone 24 seven originally before we got cameras and telecommunications up to the Caldecott. And they counted cars and they kept track of safety things and so on and so forth. And then if you can pan up to the very top, you can see that it is, uh, not yet finished the roof has not been put on um but i just thought it was important to show a picture of some of the folks who actually built this magnificent structure so thank you chris for sharing it with me and for letting me share it with everybody else awesome thanks gary um okay so we'll get into some of the uh participants questions um Byron, we got a couple here about the operation of the tube. Um, so one, was there any damage to the structure during the Loma Prieta earthquake, which ties into another emergency issue of has there ever been an accident that's caused an overwhelming amount of smoke in the tunnels? And then presumably all the tunnels would, or all the, the fans would have to go on full blast. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this. Um, so as far as earthquake tunnel and tubes, they, they do very well in, in earthquakes. Um, however, with that said, uh, we did retrofit it, the tube, I, I believe not too long ago, probably 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, so the tube has been retrofitted um, to my understanding. And then um, as far as the accidents in the car, um, um, prior to our ventilation um, repair work, um, it, it, it would get, if there's a car fire, it, the, the, the smoke will linger in there uh, for quite a while. Uh, however, um, after the uh, work that we did um, about two or three years ago, uh, it ventilates very well. Uh, we do a drill with the first responder uh, on a regular basis. Uh, to test those ventilation systems. So hopefully that answers the question. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Byron. Um, and that, uh, man, there's a lot of questions about the operation of the tube. Um, so I got another one for you. Um, for the pump system, um, let's see. For the pump system that pumps water out of the building, in the case of flooding, does it also pump the water out of the tunnel itself, or are there other mechanisms in place for present, preventing the tunnel from flooding? Yeah, so my understanding is that, like, 
in the video, there is a, a holding tank in the uh, middle of the uh, tube there. Um, so then the, the, the waters that are in there will get pumped out to the buildings and eventually onto um, outside to the drainage. Uh, so there are uh, several pumps, uh, heavy duty ones um, that would, uh, that's, that's the reason why during our big storm recently, uh, the two uh, stay relatively dry. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, let's take one pre-prepared question. Um, and this is for, for Naomi first. Um, what is one of uh, your favorite features about the Posey tube? I'm gonna try and share screen here. Just uh, to further glorify the automobile. <laughs> I just thought that everybody might enjoy this detail. Um, so from the beginning, uh, this was a, a moment of uh, really fantastic independence and freedom and air pollution when the automobile came into fashion. And so the tube has a repeated motif of uh, car wheels. Uh, this is one of them uh, underneath this security camera here. And uh, notice also that we have um, what Chris referred to before, the seagulls with their wings spread. And look what they're standing on. Those are seagulls standing on wheels, guys. Uh, I believe these are actually, these plaques are replicas um, from uh, uh, the recent and very welcomed uh, rehabilitation of this uh, of these um, portals uh, in which Caltrans uh, resurrected the original ornamentation uh, for which we are really grateful because when are you going to see a gull standing on a wheel? <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Um, anyone else want to share a fun fact or something curious about the facility before we jump back into some of these um, participant questions. Well, Naomi took mine, but because um, <laughs> that's also one of my favorite uh, decorations on the, on the thing. But the original design, I didn't mention this, the original design, they, they, were, they were considering uh, including streetcars um, to, to be accommodated in the, in the tube. Um, that didn't end up happening. And the key system that operated the streetcars sort of advocated um, for a bus uh, service to connect the two cities. And uh, that's what they went for. And three cars were not included in the final design. Thanks, Chris. Gary, yeah, you got one or Byron? I'm good. Okay. I, I did enough talking already. I think, <laughs> I think I'll mention a favorite myself um, yeah. because I noticed it when I was in their filming some of it is uh, it's just the amazing board formed concrete uh because you know each each sort of section of the uh of the tube seemed to have its own unique sort of texture uh from that and I'm, I'm not sure if any of our historians here have any insight as to how they did that or what sort of you know did they use standard two by fours or what what was kind of the process with that i don't know if there's any knowledge on that there, there are some historic photographs. They're not very good quality. John, you kind of included, I think, one in, in the movie there. Um, uh, I, I didn't see any like great ones where I could really see the details. They're, they're shown in these engineering um, magazine, you know, the engineering journals features that. I don't know, Gary, do you, have you, did you ever see anything about that? Yeah. So, yeah. but I, like one by six was a pretty common uh, form material uh, that would, you know, produce the effect you're talking about. Yeah, the forms uh, must have been enormous. <laughs> For sure. Awesome. Okay, well, let's get back into some um, audience questions. Ooh. Um. Let's go with where this was. This uh, tunnel slash tube design copied elsewhere. Um, I'm wondering, maybe Chris, do you know the answer to this? Um, I don't know if this was copied. Um, I know that um, that the 
um, what's his name, Clifford Holland, who the Holland Tunnel's named for, was consulted for the Posey tube, as well as the engineer who developed the Holland Tunnel's ventilation system, which was very similar to this one. Um, the, the ventilation system for the Holland Tunnel is a little bigger. It's like it has four ventilation um, structures, whereas the Posey tube just has two. But at the time, they kind of considered the Posey tubes to be um, you know, more even more efficient than what had been built for the Holland Tunnel. Uh, yeah, there, there are there were other tunnels built at the time, but and I don't know if the concrete um, tube sections were were used elsewhere. I, I didn't really look into them. No worries. Thanks, Chris. But that does tie into. Oh, yeah. Go, go, go. Well, I, I, I wanted to add that I first toured in the portal, I'm going to say 30, 35 years ago. And um, the Caltrans worker who took me around said that they frequently had visitors from developing countries come by to actually look at the ventilation system and see how it worked. And uh, I would love to know if something similar to this has been developed somewhere else in the world. So if anybody knows or can figure that out, we'd, we'd love to know here. Awesome. We, uh, Byron actually just hosted another uh, international tour of our other tubes for um, some other good some other folks. Um, but that would be a digression off this topic. Um, so Byron, maybe you could just talk about when the fans get turned on, when they get turned off, um, and also if there um, is an estimated engineering life safety for the tube, which I feel like I know the answers, but you can share. No, it's fine. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. Um, for tunnels and bridges, I think the life expectancy is about 75 years to 100 years. I don't know at that time when they did and what their expectancy for this. So whatever it is, we are approaching 100 years, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, so we're getting there. Uh, as far as the ventilation, so normal ven ventilation inside the, um, the tube is that uh, if, if it's less than 25 ppm. Uh, What's ppm? Will, oh, <laughs> parts per million. <laughs> uh, so uh, if it's less than that, you, you, you have one fan going on and one, one exhaust, one supply just to provide that fresh air. Uh, air quality. Uh, if it's above 25, then the other fans will turn on to lower um, down, to, back down to 25. So there are sensors inside the tube. Uh, when they reach above 50 or 100, that's when um, all the all the uh, blowers and exhaust will turn on. Um, uh, so that's how it's it's designed and 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 a program at this time. Awesome. Thanks, Byron. Um, okay. How does the impact of the Nimitz freeway affect the evacuation procedures, for example, in the event of fire? And I feel like maybe Byron can speak to that as a Caltrans representative. Um, right. So, so we, on, <laughs> we do have an emergency response plan. It, it's, it's the playbook, right, in case if there is a fire uh, we do drill on that with Alameda Fire Department as well as Oakland Fire Department. Um, they handle anything outside of the emergency as far as, uh, uh, so, so we help, we're under their direction. Um, they're the incident commander. Uh, so they will let us know, you know, um, um, what, the, you know, how, how we can assist them. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, this is going to be a quick answer, hopefully. Does anyone know how long the underwater portion is of the tube? Pop yeah. quiz, everyone. It's zero point six seven miles. Sorry, say it again. I was probably uh, talking about it. six seven miles long. Perfect. Cool. Okay. Last question. Um, what was the biggest challenge encountered in restoring the tube recently? So I might take that one. Um, as the cultural resource Caltrans person on this call. Um, so 
as I'm sure everyone can imagine, Caltrans has a lot of standard specifications um, and design plans for rehabilitating any of our systems, our facilities. And so the biggest challenge was identifying opportunities to work with our engineers to do things that are non-standard in the rehabilitation of this building. Um, and things like that include what Naomi was talking about, about, you know, taking off those panels, getting them recast, um, getting all the light standards cleaned. And then the biggest feature and arguably my favorite part about the rehab was finally getting all the wood board off and out of the windows and getting the new glass um, put back in. Um, so I think some of, the, some of those were the challenges. I think it was a really successful project as a whole. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, anyone else have other thoughts? Just to correct, I, I, I don't know if I was clear. It's it's two thirds of a mile long, 0. 0.67, not six, seven miles. So two thirds cool. of a mile long. <laughs> yeah, can I recommend that everybody try walking through the tube once? Cool. My wife and I did it. It took 11 and a half minutes. It was the noisiest 11 and a half minutes of my life. But hey, what the heck? And we'd recommend large earmuffs. Really. Right. And if you and if if you uh, the Alameda side still has the handsome um, pylons and all of that. So, you know, OK, the Oakland side's a little you know dingy, but the, the, the Alameda side, you can still see the original appearance of the, of the thing. Awesome. And so with that, we hit one o'clock. Um, and just a reminder to check out OHA's website for in-person tours. Um, and feel free to reach out to me or John or anyone on this call if you have additional questions. Back to you, John. Thank you, Helen. And thank you to our panelists. I just wanted to really uh, extend my appreciation to everybody that was involved in this uh, this project and will be involved in the future, including these public uh, to in-person tours, which I imagine will fill up very quickly. So not everybody will have a chance, which is why at some point, if um, if you decide that you want to try to register for those in-person tours and, and you don't uh, you aren't able to access them, the recording will always be available for you to watch remotely, so uh, virtually. So um, feel free to turn to our YouTube channel. Um, we posted it in full resolution, so you watch. You can watch it in 4K, just like a uh, Netflix, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, I wanted to uh, remind you that if you'd like to leave feedback, uh, you can go to CaliforniaPreservation.org slash e. Let us know how we did today, what you'd like to see in the future. There may be some more virtual tours on the way, um, and we'll be announcing those uh, if they are available to you. Uh, and um, we make these programs available for free to the public because we want to give back to the, the communities and make sure that these wonderful places are people that people know about these wonderful places and uh, advocate for their protection. Um, with that, I'm going to um, say goodbye to everybody and uh, thank our panelists, and uh, we'll see you at the next program. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all.